In the matter of the state of South Carolina against Richard Alexander Murdoch. 2022 GS 1500592, 593, 594, and 595. The following constitutes my ruling on this matter from the bench. Uh, this order will be supplemented, as I will explain, uh, after uh, proposed formal orders are received from each side in this matter. This case is unique in my 20 years of experience as a lawyer and my 35 years of experience as an active justice of the Supreme Court and a senior active trial and appellate judge. Usually matters involving possible improper contact with or conduct of a juror arise during or shortly after the trial. The judge then puts the affected juror or jurors under oath, conducts an examination, and rules on the request for a new trial or a mistrial. In this case, I was appointed almost nine months after the trial to replace the trial judge who was recused. It is now almost 10 months after the verdict was rendered and sentence imposed in this matter. It is now on appeal to the Court of Appeals. Several months after the appeal was filed, defendant moved that his appeal be suspended and this matter be remanded to the trial court to consider his motion for a new trial on a charge that the clerk of court for Colleton County tampered with the jury by expressing her opinion to the jurors about what their verdict should be and about the credibility of the defendant who had elected to take the stand and testify on his own behalf. Since this matter has been remanded to me, I have set the matter, matter for a pretrial and a final hearing conducted a telephonic status conference with the attorneys for the parties on December the 21st, 2023. I have received briefs from the parties. I conducted a pretrial proceeding on January the 16th, 2024, in which I invited briefs and arguments by the parties and by the attorneys for certain of the jurors and for the clerk of court, Rebecca Hill. On Friday, January the 26th, 2024, I conducted a hearing on this matter in which I took testimony from one of the jurors. Uh, the, test, the conduct of the examination conducted solely by me. I received further argument from the attorneys for the state and for the defendant. Today, January the 29th, 2024, I have taken sworn testimony from the remaining 11 jurors uh, who rendered a verdict in this case. Uh, this examination was conducted solely my, by me. I have found no case that provides otherwise in the many cases I have read on the subject of a motion for a new trial on the basis of after discovered evidence of jury tampering or misconduct. I have also received sworn testimony from the clerk of court Rebecca Hill. Direct examination was conducted by Deputy Attorney General Creighton Waters. Cross-examination was conducted by uh, Defendant Attorney Richard Harputlian. I have also propounded questions uh, myself to the Clerk of Court. I also received testimony from the Clerk of Court for Barnwell County, Rhonda McElveen, uh, who attended most of the trial and assisted uh, the clerk of court for, for Carlton County. I've also received testimony from the remaining alternate juror uh, who was, uh, uh, when the matter was deliberated, uh, dismissed from further service. The following is my ruling on the defendant's motion. The standard of proof. The state contends that in order to prevail, the defendant must show one, that the clerk of court made an improper comment or propounded an improper question to the member of the jury, uh, to a member of the jury who rendered the verdict. Two, defendant must further show that 
Ms. Hill's improper comment or question actually influenced the juror's verdict, citing State v. Green, State v. Aldrett, and other uh, opinions of our Supreme Court and uh, other authorities. Defendant contends that he must show only that an improper question or comment was propounded to any juror by a clerk of court Hill. If so proved, the defendant contends that the motion for the new trial must be granted. Defendant relies on United States v. Rimmer and many other cases. My ruling is this. On the law, the defendant has the burden of proving both the fact of the improper comment uh, or question by the clerk of court, Rebecca Hill, to juror, a juror or jurors, and two, prejudice suffered by the defendant, specifically that the Hill improper comments uh, in, uh, to the juror or jurors influenced the juror to vote to convict defendant Murdoch. The facts. Did clerk of court Hill make comments to any juror which expressed her opinion of what the verdict would be? Ms. Hill denies A, and so the question becomes, was her denial credible? I find that the clerk of court is not completely credible as a witness. Ms. Hill was attracted by the siren call of celebrity. She wanted to write a book about the trial and expressed that as early as November 2022, long before the trial began. She denies that uh, uh, this is so, but I find uh, that she stated to the clerk of court, Rhonda McElveen and others, her desire for a guilty verdict because it would sell books. She made comments about Murdoch's demeanor as he testified, and she made some of those comments uh, before he testified to at least one and maybe more jurors. Did Clerk of Court Hill's comments have any impact on the verdict of the jury? I find that the answer to this question is no. Each member of this jury took their involuntary assignment very seriously. They obeyed the instructions of the court. They obeyed their oath. These good and decent citizens of Carlton County stood to their duty and rendered their verdict without fear or favor. It was a difficult task. Eleven of the jurors very unconditionally said uh, they either heard no comment or if they heard a comment, it had no effect. One juror was ambivalent in her testimony. She was then examined on her previous affidavit in which she said the effect, if any, that she had was pressure she felt from other jurors. The cases are myriad that pressure from fellow jurors is a part of the normal give and take of jury deliberations. The court is not to inquire in any way about what is said in those deliberations. But the juror who was somewhat ambivalent, said on her oath at the time of trial twice and said on her oath before me in these proceedings that she stood to her oath. The clerk of court allowed public attention of the moment to overcome her duty. I have read the entire transcript of this lengthy trial, not an easy task. I have studied in detail all of the authorities cited. I have in independently researched the case law, and learned treatises, and scholarly articles on the subject. Although there is certainly a split in the federal circuits and in the states on the standard of review, I simply do not believe that the authority of our South Carolina Supreme Court requires a new trial in a very lengthy trial such as this on the strength of some fleeting and foolish comments by a publicity-influenced clerk of court. This is a matter within the discretion of the trial judge, and I am the trial judge at this moment. I do not feel that I abuse my discretion when I find the defendant's motion for a new trial 
on the factual record before me must be denied, and it is so ordered. I will file a fuller order which denies this motion on the grounds I have recited on the record before me as a trial judge uh, and the authorities that have been cited by all parties in this matter. To that end, I will hold the record open. I direct that within four business days of receipt by the attorneys in this matter of a transcript of these proceedings, a proposed order by the state denying the defendant's motion for a new trial with citations uh, be sent to me and to opposing counsel. I will allow the defendant four business days from receipt of the state's proposed order to lodge objections and or submit an alternative proposed order. Upon receipt by uh, the court of all proposed orders, I will finalize this record, submit a written order, and I will at that time transmit the written order to the Court of Appeals, uh, the court which has remanded this matter to me. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me say this, uh, and I should have said it before I began my order. Will y'all, well, hey, me members of the uh, audience, would you just be patient with me for one more minute? Please keep your seats. I have probably had more experience with trial and appellate work than anyone else in this room uh, for many years. And it has been an absolute pleasure to receive from these learned lawyers some of the best briefs I've ever received. I know they're a product not just of the attorneys who presented to me, but of the attorneys who sit with them uh, and help compose the research and the writings that I received. I know that I put you on a very tight timeline, but my feeling is these matters are best disposed of uh, by the trial judge uh, in a very timely manner so that you may then go to the authorities that really count more than I do. Uh, that is, the appellate authorities who will decide what the standard in this particular matter is. I've not seen a case such as this before. I doubt whether uh, our appellate judges have seen a case such as this before. And they will take uh, a lengthy time to study the record in this matter, the record in the part remanded to me. There are many issues in this case, uh, issues over which I have absolutely no authority whatsoever. But I will say this about uh, the record now that I have read it. And I will say this uh, about the testimony uh, that I heard uh, Friday and today. Judge Newman said it best in his sentencing when he discussed the weight and the measure of the of the uh, case presented in the testimony and evidence submitted in this case when it was tried. It is a very compelling case supporting the verdict that the jurors reached. Uh, he said it with a lot more detail than I do, but now that I've read the work record, uh, uh, I say as the successor trial judge, I agree that the evidence was overwhelming and the jury verdict not surprising. This matter is now adjourned. All right, I love her, Michael Ayala. She, what a justice, and yeah. putting it all out there, admitting mm -hmm. she didn't know what standard of proof, but mm -hmm. here was the one she would apply. I am surprised, no new trial, but she made very clear that she found the juror was ambivalent, mm -hmm. who said that it impacted her decision, and that she also said she stood on her oath 
the evidence was overwhelming to this judge, mm -hmm. justice, and therefore no new trial. Yeah, I think that was the key. Um, uh, they, they, it was harmless error, ultimately, at the end, and that it was the, the original case was so compelling, mm -hmm. so overwhelming. Um, I think that was the thing that she sort of planted her, her, her decision on, uh, right? Judge Newman's words that it was a compelling case and there was overwhelming evidence. Let's bring in our guest here, joining us still to discuss trial attorney Wendy Patrick. Wendy, I have to get your, uh, uh, your reaction uh, to the decision by the judge. I know j both judge and I thought there might be a real strong case for a new trial. Turns out ju justice told didn't, didn't agree. I think a lot of people thought it would be a new trial. Not that it would be a real strong case, but the fact that you had one juror that was unequivocal, at least when she testified, uh, that it influenced her verdict. But what this justice did, no doubt by virtue of all those decades of experience, is she backed up and took a more global view of the fact pattern, mm -hmm. of the misconduct, of the effect of the misconduct, and also reminded everybody that case law doesn't allow us to pervade the deliberative process of the jury, i.e. what the other jurors said to pressure juror Z into changing her verdict and who knows how much of that versus how much of what the clerk said actually made a difference and so this justice and I like the fact that she told us that she'd taken the time and I can only imagine how long that took for a six-week trial to read all of that transcript testimony talk about taking your job seriously how'd you like to be the appellate court overturning the verdict or the finding the ruling of an ex-supreme court justice a retired Supreme Court justice. So all that to say that editorialism at the end was really to the benefit not only of the record but look how she even complimented the attorneys uh, and no doubt the law clerks and the legal teams involved for all the great work that they did. She's a professional. Yeah, no she question. is a professional and she even said listen I'm sure this is going I wanted to do this quickly because this is going to go to the Court of Appeals to determine the proper standard because this yeah. is a unique case I don't know what it is. How many justices or judges will stand up up and say, I don't even know if I did this right. I know that's for the appellate courts to decide, but this is my ruling. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously, she said, this was a, a case of first impression. Mm -hmm. She talked about all her myriad experience, uh, not only trying Phenomenal. cases, but also in the appellate uh, division as well. Uh, so I found that very interesting. And she's, you know, usually judges, you know, they're very sort of protective of their decisions. But here she was clear. Look, this is the way I see it, but I encourage you to continue to press this because this is a first impression. And I'm making a ruling but maybe the Court of Appeals will see it different. And I'm smiling when I ask you this, Wendy, but do you think Alec Murdoch will file that appeal? His lawyers will definitely file the appeal. I mean, they've got nothing but time. I mean, he's going to be in, in custody for a very long time. Um, had this been granted, you wonder whether or not that plea where he just signed up for the, all those decades on the uh, financial crimes might have been rethought as well. But, you know, the fact that this judge was honest about it being a case of first impression, there's, I mean, every case in some sense is a case of first impression, usually not to this point magnitude. But what she did is she built the foundation upon which the appellate court is going to review this. It's not a flimsy foundation. We were all waiting for the drum roll, waiting for her final decision to come. But what did she do? She bolstered it with facts and law to the extent to which it's really airtight in the sense that sh the issues she ruled on. So it's not unusual to rule on those issues. Maybe procedurally it's unique, but it really gives the appellate court a lot of information that they're now going to use to tackle their task in reviewing uh, the wisdom of the decision that she made.